All right, we're streaming on YouTube. So I will get us started if everyone's ready. So thanks for joining us at another media briefing. It is Wednesday, May 27th, and we have statements from all our panel members today. Um, just a note before we get started, that uh, beginning next week, we will be going down to two media briefings a week. I believe most of you are probably aware of this already, um, but just a reminder, so we'll be doing media briefings on Tuesdays and Fridays. So next week, I believe that would be June 2nd and 5th. And we'll continue to remind you with our emails and uh, links to the proper uh, Zoom meetings. So I will uh, get us started. Uh, Dr. Shuli Wong has a statement followed by Regional Chair Karen Redmond and also our CAO Mike Murray will be giving an enforcement update. Um, I will pass it over to Dr. Wong. Go ahead, Shuli. Thank you, Bethany. Good morning. So overall, the number of new cases has continued to stabilize. As of 10 a.m. Uh, this morning, our dashboard reports that the total number of COVID associated deaths remains at 113. Of these, 20 are associated with cases in the community and 93 are associated with long-term care and retirement home outbreaks. Approximately 6.6% of people tested in Waterloo Region are testing positive for COVID-19. A total of 775 cases or 71% of cases in Waterloo Region have now been classified as resolved. There are currently 207 active cases of which 86% are isolating at home or in their congregate setting home and 13% are in hospital at this time. Two cases are still under investigation. So overall, the signs are tentatively positive, but we are still in a very delicate state. This stabilization is the result of residents following public health measures and where we go from here will largely depend on the actions all of us take as a community. So we need to continue to practice physical distancing whenever we leave our homes and wear a non-medical mask when we, when we are in close proximity to others. We need to wash our hands often. We need to only spend time with our household contacts for now. We need to make an appointment to get tested and stay home if we develop symptoms. And as a reminder, a negative test does not exempt anyone from having, having to follow those measures. So thank you to our community for all your efforts to date and let's continue to work together. Thank you. Thank you, Shuli. I will pass it over to Chair Redmond. Go ahead, Karen. Thanks, Bethany. As I mentioned last week, we're working hard on back to business plans. Yesterday, council discussed plans to tentatively reopen uh, regional administrative buildings to employees and the public beginning in early to mid June. This will happen when the province begins phase two of their recovery plan. The majority of regional services have continued as usual or in an alternate format through this pandemic. But when we're fully reopened buildings and programs, we wanna make sure that we ensure the health and safety of employees and customers. We maximize service to citizens, we return laid off staff to work and minimize negative year end financial impacts. We're also adapting our buildings, service delivery and programming to meet public health guidelines. This means you might notice some new business practices that reflect our changing environment. For example, plexiglass barriers to customer service areas and on buses. New rules in our buildings to ensure physical distancing, like limiting the number of people in elevators or being required to make appointments, more hand sanitizing stations, and more services available online. We will continue to share more information about this as it unfolds. We appreciate your patience as we adapt to our new normal. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. 
Okay, and last but not least, I will pass it over to CAO Mike Murray. Go ahead, Mike. Great. Yeah, thanks, Bethany. And uh, so our usual uh, Wednesday morning update on uh, monitoring compliance and enforcement activities for the previous week. So from last Wednesday to now. Um, so uh, again, our four partners, so regional bylaw, uh, area municipal bylaw enforcement, regional public health inspectors, and Waterloo Region Police. So combined, um, a total uh, over the past week of 156 uh, site visits where they you know, engage with people to provide education, awareness, and or warnings. So 156 of those. Um, 300 site visits where no action was required, either because they got there and uh, issues had resolved or they showed up and you know people were fully in compliance with um, with all the uh, orders and guidelines and over the past week um, three new charges laid all of these charges were uh, in the city of Waterloo laid by city of Waterloo bylaw enforcement and all related to gatherings of more than five people in private residences so that's the update. The total activity then was, uh, if you add that all up, 459 points of contact um, with, uh, with the public. Happy to answer any questions about that or anything else. Thanks, Mike. All right, we can get started with media questions. I'm sure there are a lot and we'll start with Damon today. Go ahead, Damon. Hello, uh, my first question is for Dr. Wong. If a public business um, gets a case of COVID, are they required to release that um, to the public if the private company has a case in their uh, business? No. Okay, and then my second question is for Mike Murray. For the no. charges in large group gatherings, um, does everyone get that fine or is it only the property owner? That is a really good question. And I don't have a good answer for that. So Damon, um, we will try to find out and probably email it out to this whole group. Uh, I'll, we'll find out the info and I'll rely on Bethany to send it out to the group. That, that's a really good question. I'm suspecting it's the property owner. Like I'm suspecting we only issue one, one charge, uh, but it's a good question. So I need to confirm that. Okay. That's my questions for now. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Damon. We'll get back to you with the answer. Um, I will pass it on to the next person, Kate from CBC. Go ahead, Kate. Great. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, Dr. Wong, I was looking at uh, a story from our colleagues in Hamilton where they talked about public health ordering homes to have detailed outbreak plans. Did the region of Waterloo require that of our long-term care and or retirement homes early on in the pandemic? Um, so they, they are already required to have that. So, um, you know, that was, um, they, they were issued directives by the province in order uh, to be as prepared as they could be uh, for COVID-19. So uh, what our inspectors uh, did do is uh, follow up with the homes and um, uh, we've uh, followed up uh, with all of the long-term care homes and uh, re retirement homes uh, to uh, ensure that they continue to take, um, you know, that the, 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 the measures that uh, they, they need to take and, uh, you know, uh, continue and we'll continue to follow up with them uh, on progress on, on, on achieving all those measures if they haven't been met. And do we have a sense of whether or not there are homes that are lacking? Like Hamilton in particular, they had 31 homes that didn't have enough PPE, didn't have a plan in place, um, had a lack of written policies, that sort of thing. Like, are there any homes in Waterloo Region that are sort of on a similar list that they need to do more? Mm -hmm. So what we have noticed when um, uh, you know, we, uh, we review the status of homes, which we also do in partnership um, with other health system partners. Now it's a whole of system response and support uh, for these homes, because we know that this is a sector that has 
uh, significant gaps uh, in terms of a, of a system. Um, so what we do notice it, it, uh, are that um, there are uh, three types of issues that are most uh, prevalent and they have to do with um, staffing. They're already in, often in precarious states of staffing and when they uh, get into outbreak, uh, that can be exacer exacerbated. Uh, the second item is infection prevention and control. Um, this is a, 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 an infection for which that has to be really, really tight uh, in terms of um, ensuring that the measures are in place. Uh, even though we don't have a vaccine, um, oh, we don't have a medication. So we need to uh, focus uh, a lot on, on uh, prevention. And that is an area where, you know, uh, as a system, there are a lot of uh, issues that continue to need to, 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 to be improved upon. And uh, thirdly, uh, PPE, um, the availability and supply of PPE that has improved compared to the beginning of the pandemic, but it is still an issue where, you know, um, uh, there can continue to be um, precarious stock of PPE. Uh, so again, it's, uh, I would say that those are the system issues that uh, we're seeing here that I think are seen across the province. Um, and so that is why there have been, you know, significant efforts that have been put in place from system, um, sorry, from, from health system partners to try to bolster um, the homes. Uh, and that continues to this day. We continue to, um, to have to provide support. Uh, so I would say that those are, the, those are the general observations that we've made. This, this will continue to be an issue. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure the government will review this and, um, and we'll, we'll, we'll see what that gives. Um, but in the meantime, locally here, we're going to continue to do our best. And some of the reports that came out yesterday um, regarding the military's reports to the province um, offered some pretty horrific encounters for, for staff and, and for the residents in these homes. Are mm. there any homes in Waterloo Region where your inspectors have seen similar issues or have raised concerns that, um, you know, the people living there aren't getting the standard of care where they should be right now? Not to the extent that we saw in that report. Yeah. No, though, you know, we've seen some system issues related to those three broad categories. Um, but uh, no, that, uh, that report was very tragic. Um, we haven't seen that to that extent. Uh, but I, I think, again, it, it's a sign that, um, that there are significant issues in that sector overall. Great, and if I can just do one more. Um, this is either to Chair Redmond or, or Mike. Um, with the province announcing today that they're extending emergency orders to June 9th, how does that or does it impact the, the region reopening administrative offices and bringing back staff? Or is it still gonna be sort of that phased in, still looking more mid-June as opposed to maybe early June? Yes. Yeah. So absolutely. Um, you know, what we've said in, in our, um, you know, recovery planning framework is um, we would tie the reopening of regional buildings to the public, to the province um, moving to the next stage of their uh, reopening plan, right? So they're now in stage one. Um, we would use as sort of the trigger for us reopening to the public, province moving to stage two. Uh, which they said would be two to four weeks after they entered stage one, subject to, you know, what the trends look like. So, you know, um, they've said two to four weeks per stage. Um, so that would put us into early to mid-June. Um, given, I think, recent trends, that's likely to be closer to mid-June than early June. Uh, but we're, you know, actually monitoring that. And, you know, as with everything pandemic-related, we've said this is our tentative plan. Um, subject to monitoring what the province does and 
monitoring trends uh, provincially and locally. Good, thank you very much. Thanks, Kate. I will pass it over to Joanna from the record. Go ahead, Joanna. All right, thank you. Um, a couple questions uh, for Dr. Wong. Uh, race base and socioeconomic data, where are we with collecting that? And is that something that would be made public? Yeah, so um, we understand that the province will be rolling that out provincially soon. And, um, you know, if the province coordinates that, it will be a lot less work on local health units. Uh, and that uh, it will be uh, an optional question that people can respond to. And uh, yeah, if, if we have that data, then uh, we can report on it. Yes. So no date on that yet then? No. Okay. Uh, and then a question for a colleague. If a resident at Forest Heights or say another long-term care home tested positive, but was asymptomatic, would they mm -hmm. be tested again? And who would decide that? And when would it happen? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it depends on um, obviously their result. I, I think you, sorry, um, I think you mentioned they tested positive. Yes, but were yes. asymptomatic. So it, it depends on why we would do um, a retest. For Forest Heights, given the scale and scope of the outbreak, uh, there have been a lot of additional tests that have been done on residents. Um, you know, uh, testing in this particular situation is particularly helpful uh, in terms of uh, being one of the key measures for assessing what is going on in the home. Uh, so it, it would depend on the circumstances um, of, you know, if, for example, uh, we, we wanted to ensure um, that that resident was negative uh, before potentially moving them to an area of the home that would have other patients who are negative, for example. So that could be one reason for a retest. Um, uh, sometimes uh, uh, they're retested, um, you know, just to see um, how they've evolved in terms of their resolution. Uh, for some outbreaks and, uh, uh, and, for, and, and um, based on some homes preferences, residents can be retested to determine if they have cleared the, 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 the virus as opposed to the general uh, recommendation where, um, whereby if it's been 14 days um, since the start of their symptoms or since their positive test, then you can consider them resolved. That's the latest you know, provincial guidance for the, uh, for the large majority of people. Uh, but in some specific circumstances, some specific outbreaks, for example, or some specific residents in an outbreak situation, or sometimes at the preference of the facility for residents or staff, um, we may choose, uh, or the facility may choose to use what's called a test-based approach. Uh, so taking tests, repeat tests, uh, to determine whether or not, um, you know, they still have the virus. So. It depends is the answer. So then whose discretion would it be? Public um, health or the home? Uh, well, generally, uh, public health does provide recommendations to the home. And the home generally does follow uh, recommendations. Uh, if there are instances where, uh, you know, there, both options are equally good in a, in a particular situation, then the home can make that decision. All right, uh, and then I had another question uh, probably for uh, Mike or Karen. Uh, does the region have a plan to get people back on transit? Um, and then sort of related, are there plans to improve cycling and trail infrastructure for people who don't wanna get back on transit, but you also don't want them getting into cars? Yep, so, so yes, the back to transit plan, um, you know, I think you're aware we're, we're moving back to, um, fare collection and front door boarding on, uh, on buses. And, uh, you know, to facilitate that or enable that, um, by June 1st, we will have plexiglass shields installed on all of our buses to provide, you know, some separation between driver and passenger. Um, we've done 
done, continue to do enhanced cleaning um, on the buses. Um, and we put in place, you know, some physical distancing measures on the buses. So all those things we've done, we believe have created a safe environment for both transit customers and for transit operators. Uh, so that's the transit piece. And then on active transportation, so encouraging cycling and walking, um, regional staff are working really closely with area municipal staff about, um, you know, what, what can be done uh, to provide enhanced facilities for cycling and walking. Uh, so that's a work in progress right now. And um, we've got uh, some reports scheduled to come back to regional council related to active transportation on June the 16th. All right, thank you. Those are my questions for now. Welcome. Thanks, Joanna. I will pass it over to James for questions. Go ahead, James. Thanks. Uh, my question is uh, for Dr. Wong. Um, after the, the military report came out yesterday, uh, have we considered uh, getting the military to come into any of our local long-term care facilities here? Hi, that's a, that's a provincial decision. Um, you know, we um, uh, provide information up to the province and um, all health units do, and all system partners do. And um, the province then makes a determination of uh, where to ask the military to go and provide support. Would they would they ask um, any public health units, you know, to give recommendations on any homes that that could require some military involvement, or is that specifically up to uh, the provinces? Uh, for sure, you know, they um, they ask us for information, and if they have questions for us, uh, we answer them. As I mentioned earlier, you know, right now. Uh, with the uh, gaps that we have identified in the in the long-term care home, retirement home sector across the province, um, there are multiple health system partners that are helping out in these homes. Uh, not all of them, right? But in certain homes, um, and um, you know, so we are asked to provide information and updates. And uh, if they have questions, we answer them and the province makes a determination based on the info uh, that we provide them, as well as um, uh, their own, uh, obviously, decision on that. Okay, and uh, another question for you, Dr. Wong. Uh, have we seen an increase in testing since we opened it up to the general public to go and get tested? Hi, James. I, I will have to refer that question to uh, the assessment centers and um, uh, Lee Freckloff is the, is the lead uh, for the assessment centers for the region. Uh, so you could uh, try her through Ann Kelly. Um, they are really overseeing this, um, uh, they're really overseeing the testing in the, in the region and they would be the most familiar with what the volumes have been as of late. I do, I, I, I do understand that they have uh, definitely increased as as has elsewhere in the province. Okay, and I have a, I have a question for Mike Murray as well. Um, the city of Stratford has opened up cooling centers for today and tomorrow. Is the region of Waterloo still uh, standing by not opening up cooling centers? And if if there's any uh, any plan to revisit that or for future uh, you know heat waves that we have coming? Yeah. So thank thanks for the question, James. Um, yeah, so the issue about cooling centers, it's, uh, it's a challenging one, and I would say the region and the area municipalities are working really closely together on, uh, you know, figuring out arrangements. Likely, we will not get cooling centers in place uh, for this heat wave, which we expect to end either tonight or tomorrow morning. Uh, but, you know, we expect that there will be more extreme heat events over the course of the summer, and so we will have uh, plans in place for opening up cooling centers between the region and each of the area municipalities. We'll have those plans in place uh, for subsequent um, extreme heat events. Uh, what I would say, a couple things though, um, for today and tomorrow, um, there are daytime drop-in spaces available for people who are street involved and you know don't have a home to go to. Um, so there is one in Kitchener at St. John's Kitchen that is, is open for 
people who are street involved who need a place to you know drop in and, and cool themselves off. So St. John's Kitchen in downtown Kitchener and 150 Main Street in Cambridge uh, are two daytime drop-in centers where uh, people who don't have any place else to go can drop in and cool off. Um, otherwise, uh, there's lots of information on public health's website about um, ways to stay healthy and stay cool uh, during extreme heat events. And so I would encourage people to go and check that out. But for subsequent heat events, uh, yeah, the region and the air municipalities will have cooling centers in place. And it's been particularly challenging, as you know, because typically the locations where those would be uh, right now are all closed. And so, so trying to make sure we can open those up and do it in a healthy and safe way, um, that's what's caused the, the short-term immediate challenge. So I hope that helps. Okay, Mike, and, and just to follow that up, um, have, we, have we decided to uh, follow up with uh, the city of Stratford or any area municipalities who have opened up cooling centers and how they've been able to do that safely? Yeah, so, um, you know, it, it, again, the region has a role to play and each of the area municipalities have a role to play. A number of municipalities in Southern Ontario have opened up cooling centers. So I think there's lots of, there's lots of lessons learned. Uh, so I don't think it's a matter of figuring out how to do it. I, I think, you know, we all know how to do that. Uh, it's a matter of figuring out what are the appropriate locations and making sure that we've got appropriate protective measures in place in those locations and appropriate staff available uh, to staff those locations. And, you know, frankly, um, uh, this was extreme heat event in May uh, was a little bit sooner than uh, we've seen extreme heat events in, in the past. So uh, it just takes a little bit of time to get both the facilities uh, in place and the staffing in place. Okay, thanks. That's all my questions. Okay, thank you, James. I will pass it over to Nicole from CTV. Go ahead. Hi, good morning. Um, this is a question for um, Dr. Wong. Um, you know, we covered yesterday the pop-up testing site that was conducted in Kitchener uh, this past month three times mm -hmm. with public health officials as a part of this, you know, you know, gearing towards the First Nations, Métis, and Inuit community, uh, but we were told it was a walk-up site, no appointments were needed, and no one was turned away. Given the more volume and the capacity now of more people wanting to be tested, is the region going to perhaps fast track this model and have more of these pop-up testing sites for the general public? Okay, so um, testing is not overseen by the region. So the testing models um, are overseen by the hospitals who run the assessment centers and there can be mobile outreach. Um, so for example, the indigenous um, uh, population is a priority population and has been for some time already uh, for, for, for testing. So, um, you know, I think yesterday um, you had the opportunity to speak with Dr. Sharon Ball, who has been the physician, you know, sort of leading this um, work of outreach to the Indigenous um, people in order to um, try to encourage um, testing uh, um, as, as, as needed. And we, we know this is a population that may not always come to the traditional healthcare settings and uh, for whom we are working to establish um, good relationships based on trust. And so there's been a lot of work to, uh, you know, to really um, uh, facilitate and enable testing um, uh, among this population. And that's, and that's uh, led by Dr. Sharon Ball. She is doing it with physicians that are part of an Ontario health team uh, and all those partners, right, are uh, doing it under um, the assessment centers as a mobile outreach team. Um, so that's really that. Um, that that really explains what that was. 
And your questions about what are the models, the, 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 the future models for, for, for testing, uh, again, uh, that would be best answered uh, by the assessment centers um, themselves. Okay, what the region did as a partner was facilitate that, right? So uh, public health provided the swabs, for example. So, uh, you know, the partners obviously do what, whatever they can in order to uh, try to facilitate that type of testing. Um, but it, 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 the region is not coordinating uh, the testing strategy overall. Um, given that we were told that they are looking at potential locations and centers where they could have a pop-up testing site and it would also you know be based on um, uh, geography uh, you know geography to hospitals to make sure that they're in the appropriate areas for testing mm -hmm. you know i guess this is a question from mike murray have you had those discussions about potentially having it in um a community center or um, a place like the odd let's say Um, so the short answer is, um, so I've not been involved in any of those discussions and, you know, I would just reinforce what Dr. Wong said, which is, um, you know, there's a team working on this and, um, you know, they involve all the people that they need to involve to come up with the right strategy. Mm -hmm. Okay, nothing That's further, it. Nicole. Thank you. Okay, uh, I will pass it on to, I believe, the last person on my list, who is Irene. Go ahead, Irene. Great, thank you. I don't have a question of my own, but pardon me if I missed it. Damon asked if the names of businesses would be released if they have a staff member with a case of COVID. What was the answer to that? No, no. We, we don't release information and, um, unless we believe there is a, a, a public health reason uh, to release it. Um, so we expect that there will be there will be cases among employees just like there are cases in the general public and there are a lot of people that are employees somehow um, uh, you know, business or whatever uh, employer. As, uh, as, uh, as the economy opens up and restrictions are lifted, I expect that there will be more cases among workers. But, uh, you know, that doesn't necessarily mean that there is a risk associated with that workplace for which there needs to be a public health notification or alert, right? If we have um, situations where, um, you know, we think that there's an ongoing risk in a particular area uh, that would be different than the general population risk that, is ex that exists out there, um, then we would provide that type of notification. Great, that's it for me, thank you. Okay, thank you, Irene. Um, it looks like a few of us are having um, a connection or bandwidth issues. So uh, maybe uh, we're wrapping up just in time, but I do see Kate waving at me. So I will let her in for a final question. Go ahead, Kate. Thank you, sorry. Um, oh, Dr. Wong, Forest Heights reported three new cases today. Um, given that the death the other day was a historical, like one from mid-May, are those three cases reported today new or are they ones that are just sort of catch up? Do you know? So we have done um, we have done a lot of additional testing at Forest Heights and, um, uh, you know, uh, recently I recommended uh, another round of testing for certain um, residents and, uh, yeah, these would, if they've been added to the dashboard as new cases, um, uh, then these are new cases. Um, so it is uh, something that... Uh, the health system partners and our team will be looking into. Bethany, mm -hmm. um, can you hear me? Now we can't hear you, Beth, you're muted. Sorry, sorry about that. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, 
So um, I, I have an answer to, I think it was Damon's question about, um, you know, when these are charges laid for uh, gatherings of more than five people. So the answer back is um, a, a ticket can only be served on an individual and would typically be to the business or property owner as the person accountable for the infraction. So Damon, I think the short answer to your question is um, one charge, one ticket gets issued. And in that case to the property owner. So if they're in a public gathering and it's one of those past issues, how would that go about if there's more than one person in this group gathering in a public location? Yeah, Sorry. I, yeah I can't answer that. Okay, maybe. But, in a, but these were all, you know, these ones were uh, more than five people in private residences. So, you know, it would be the, um, you know, owner, tenant uh, of, the, of the residence. Okay, thank you. Damon, I will see if I can find that answer for you and we'll get back to you on that. Is there anyone else who has a final question? Nicole and then Joanna, go ahead, Nicole. Um, with businesses slowly um, being allowed to open up, are there special measures in place for businesses that are particularly early summer attractions like St. Jacob's or Bingham's or African Lion Safari because these are the type of places their families would typically would want to go to on a nice hot summer weekend. So, so I don't know if, if Dr. Wong wants to add, the, the one thing I would say is, you know, the emergency orders and provincial guidance um, is in place like across the board. So, you know, the um, avoiding um, public gatherings of more than five people, physical distancing, uh, they continue to be in place and enforceable. Um, in addition, the province has published, guide, I think, 60 different um, guidelines for different business sectors uh, to inform, you know, how businesses can open slash reopen safely. Um, so, you know, if, if businesses are looking for guidance, um, they should go and look on um, that provincial website that includes, like I said, I, I think it's up to 60 now, um, and it's sector specific. Hi, I'm sorry, I got kicked off. I'm, I'm back now. Using That's okay, phone. Shuli is back with us on her phone. So we'll see if the last question, did that answer your question, Nicole? Okay, and I'm gonna pass it to Joanna for her question, go ahead. Thank you. And I'm not sure who is best to answer this, but just in light of the new charges laid at homes where there were gatherings, is there a concern that perhaps more and more people will be going to other people's homes to socialize? And that, unless somebody complains, we're not knowing about that. So that could possibly sort of increase the risk of the virus spreading more in the community and more positive cases. So I'll just make a general comment, you know, in terms of the monitoring uh, and enforcement and, and Dr. Wang may wanna comment as well. Um, Joanna, it, it's why, you know, um, Dr. Wang and Chair Redmond and I keep reinforcing the need to continue to follow the emergency orders and the guidelines around avoiding large gatherings, physical distancing, good personal hygiene. Um, you know, as Dr. Wang has said a number of times, we're at a precarious time in, in, in the response. And so we encourage everybody to continue to follow those guidelines. I think the fact that, you know, the province today extended the emergency orders uh, to, the, you know, June 9th, I think it is, you know, that's sending a pretty clear message that uh, these orders are still in effect and they're still enforceable. Yeah, I would just add two quick things. One, please don't do that. Uh, number two, um, we know that the most likely way for people to become infected is through close contact with others, such as family and friends. So when people do this, they increase their risks. And not only do they increase the risks for themselves, they increase the risks of passing the infection onto those that they are closest to. So yeah, I would really ask people not to do that. Um, you know, go outside, um, have some exercise, enjoy the fresh air, 
make sure you maintain physical distancing. But for now, please only stay with your immediate household members. All right, does that answer your question, Joanna? Yeah. Okay, last call for any final, final questions. I don't see any hands, so we can wrap it up. Thanks for joining us and we'll see you again Friday. And then just a final reminder that next week we're moving to two briefings, so Tuesday and Friday. Thanks again, everyone. We'll see you next time.